Good afternoon and welcome to another A Push video with Mr. Pate from Barlow High School. Today we're looking at the Vietnam War. We're going to get right into it. Vietnam War, the domino theory said that essentially this area that was all French Indochina was its earlier name when it was a colony of France, that this entire area com comprised of Burma, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, that if any one of these countries fell to communism, as China had, as North Korea had, that they would all fall. It was like a set of dominoes. This, from the Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson administrations, is going to strike fear in the hearts of these presidents and their teams in the Pentagon. This could not be allowed to happen. That would be a failure of containment. And um, so that's where they start, is this, this, this is kind of a feeling they just have. A roading supporter of Ngo Diem, uh, Diem. Diem uh, was actually a kind of Vietnamese expatriate Catholic who was living in New Jersey. He is sent back to kind of take control of the country. They have fighting going on between, you know, the French and a guy that had been kind of left there by the French. He was terrible. So Diem replaces him. And the United States has some feelings that there's promise here. He starts to westernize South Vietnam. He is opening it to trade with the United States. He is pro-U.S. and anti-communist. So these things seem like great things. The only problem is he becomes very corrupt. He becomes quite nepotistic, which means he's putting all of his friends and family in all these important roles. There's a lot of corruption going on. He's also persecuting and attacking the Buddhist population of South Vietnam. Now, you probably don't know this, but the middle and upper class of Vietnam were Catholic. The lower class, which was much more numerous, that was Buddhist. And the reason for this is the French were Catholic. They'd had control of this area for most of a century. And so many people had become Catholic during this time. But you have these two different religions. And so he's attacking the Buddhists. Diem, I mean, they're gonna, it's going to get very, very ugly. Uh, the United States does not like the corruption. They, Kennedy, by the time he's in there, he's asking Diem to reform and clean things up. And Diem basically tells him to take a hike knowing the U.S. needs him because the U.S. really doesn't want the domino theory to occur over here. So with that being the case, uh, support starts to erode. The American public sees Buddhist m monks setting themselves on fire uh, on TV, and it's horrifying people. So the American public really sours on DM. Um, the U.S. starts to cut back his resources and aid, and South Vietnamese generals say, hey, well, if he's not America's golden boy, let's get rid of him. So they launch a coup with at least CIA approval uh, that that would be okay, and they get rid of Diem, and he was supposed to be sent to the United States, but they end up killing him. So Diem is gone, and now at this point the United States, and, uh, shortly after Diem's demise, uh, a couple weeks later President Kennedy is assassinated, so this situation all becomes Johnson's. Johnson's War. Uh, the first idea is the strategic hamlets. Basically, we better define a couple of terms. The North Vietnamese communists that were basically most of the country were the Viet Minh, like Ho Chi Minh, okay? And then you had down here, you had anti-communist people, but you also had a, a smaller faction that were these communist guerrillas that wanted all of S South Vietnam to join North Vietnam as a communist country. They're called the Viet Cong. And they have this kind of back trail that goes through Laos where you can get by this heavily defended border called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And this trail is basically very tough to find and attack because there's a lot of underground tunnels, but it was a way to get people and supplies with crossing that border to come down into South Vietnam. So Johnson's solution is strategic hamlets and a bombing. The Viet Cong were um, attacking these villagers in South Vietnam, these peasants, and they would say, support us, help us, join us, or die. And so the strategic hamlets were building new villages in different locations that would have South Vietnamese army of people there, their soldiers, to defend them. And then they would essentially, um, they would essentially be like defended and safe from these attacks by the Viet Cong. But they don't like living in this other area. They feel kind of like they're interned almost. They don't like giving up where they did live. Even though this is a well-intentioned program trying to save their lives and protect them, it's a disaster. It doesn't work. This ends up turning some of the South Vietnamese peasants against the United States, which totally backfired, of course. And then the bombing. The United States under Johnson is going to start secretly bombing into Laos, trying to destroy the Ho Chi Minh Trail and stop 
the flood of weapons and uh, troops down into the south. Okay, so the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution essentially is going to be the goal. It's it's going to be like opening up the conflict for uh, for Johnson to do whatever he wants. It's a blank check essentially. And so what's going to happen is uh, off the coast within international waters, this U.S. this U.S. naval ship is going to be attacked by um, North Vietnamese ships after South Vietnamese ships had attacked it. And then there's this second attack later on that allegedly occurs, but they don't know if there was actually an attack or not. So it kind of similar to how Polk kind of starts a conflict that starts the Mexican-American War. Um, the U.S. is kind of just nearby, and it's, you know, when the North Vietnamese attack, the U.S. wasn't really involved, but they were in a hostile area. Anyhow, Johnson takes this and says, hey, the U.S. is blatantly attacked. Congress gives him a blank check, essentially, without a declaration of war, to do whatever it takes to basically save South Vietnam and protect U.S. troops, who up to this point had been advisors. So, what emerges after the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution gives uh, Johnson this commanding control to do whatever he basically wants to, you get Operation Rolling Thunder. Operation Rolling Thunder is going to be massive amounts of bombing in Laos and North Vietnam. Um, and it, you know, essentially during the entire Vietnam War, the U.S. drops more bombs than the U.S. had dropped during all of World War II on just Vietnam. Um, and it's very difficult because you don't have a lot of uh, military and industrial targets you can see. It's not like they were, you could take out their factories to produce weapons. They're getting their, fa their, their weapons off the coast from a, you know, a port in China. And, and really, this becomes a very difficult situation because Johnson is fighting a limited war. And what we mean by this is there is not going to be a full-scale invasion of North Vietnam. Johnson fears that will bring China in, just like when they push too close to the Korean border in the, in the Korean War in North Korea. He also fears that if they bomb this port near China, where China is supplying them with all of these weapons from the, U the USSR and China, that that could bring China into the war. So he can't launch a full invasion. He's not going to use nukes. That might bring in China. He's not going to bomb even the city that's closest to it. So this is going to be escalation in kind of a defensive, semi-attacking way where they're not really going to send troops to try and invade North Vietnam at all. And that makes it a limited war and really an unwinnable war for the most part. Escalation and deception. Essentially what's going to happen, the war is going to dramatically increase after the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The U.S. is going to send in uh, an ever-increasing number of troops that crests in 1969 with 550,000 troops. Right after the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, the, the troop numbers swell up to 200,000 and just goes up and up and up. 1969, it's 550,000 troops that are in South Vietnam and they're fighting in, in this limited war type of scenario. So that's the escalation. But the deception is the Pentagon supplies Johnson with numbers that minimize untruthfully the casualty counts and they prop up any victories they get. They minimize and try and discard the death tolls, uh, the casualty counts, the, the losses that are, that are uh, incurred. And all that you hear in the press conferences from the military or from the White House is the war is going well, we're getting there, we're going to win. And the American public generally is going with that. Now, this is the first televised war. And as the American population sees, you know, the destruction of these villages, they start to question the war more and say, why are we doing this? So the media starts to play a major major role, and then you get the Tet Offensive. And this is in January 1968. It is a holiday in Vietnam. They did not anticipate an attack. So many troops have come through the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They launch an attack on massive amounts of different locations, uh, even Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, all at the same time, the simultaneous attack, and they rock back the South Vietnamese and U.S. forces significantly and take a lot of these, these locations. Now, eventually, the United States is able to push them back, and they are able to inflict massive casualties on the, the North Vietnamese. So you might say, oh, well, that's a U.S. victory, because technically the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong had far higher casualty counts and all this. But the American public saw this war that they've been told, it's going so well, the U.S. is going to win, we're making great progress. They see chaos and a 
huge loss on behalf of the U.S. And so this really starts to undermine Johnson. They start saying there's a credibility gap. Um, some people start telling Johnson the war is basically unwinnable. And they also say that even if the war was winnable, the United States can't expand the, the war anymore. The Pentagon wants another quarter million troops. The United States cannot do that because it would completely destroy the great society. So Johnson, on the one hand, has these noble goals of creating this great society, and he's spending lots of money on that, but he's escalating Vietnam with a domino theory mentality. I cannot lose this. We have to do it. It's not going to happen on my watch. And so after the Tet Offensive, basically within two months, as escalation has continued and the U.S. is involved and all these attacks, Democrats within his party in this election year of 1968 start to challenge Johnson. Johnson is going to eventually say, uh, we're going to the peace table, um, we're, and basically we're going to try and get the war over with, and he says, I'm not running for president again for the next term. Shocking Americans, uh, but his popularity was so low by that point, he's being protested everywhere he went, uh, that was a wise choice on his part. So what you get through 1968 is this divided Democratic Party, and um, you know Robert Kennedy looks like he's going to take control and become the candidate eventually, and he'll win against Hubert Humphrey, and then he gets assassinated. And so now everything defaults to Hubert Humphrey. They have a contested convention for the Democrats. It's total chaos. The Republicans, meanwhile... Uh, they have a different faction of the country supporting them, saying peace with honor, peace with honor under Nixon. And, you know, the anti-Vietnam protests are just raging out of control in 1967 and 1968. And the country appears to be kind of coming unpinned or unhinged, just falling apart. When all of this happens, essentially, uh, Nixon is going to win a victory against Hubert Humphrey and become the next president. And he is going to issue the Nixon Doctrine. A good change to our doctrines. And it says the United States will help fight communism and support countries that help themselves. Essentially, what had happened during Johnson's time was the United States, Americans took over all the fighting, basically, of the Vietnam War from the South Vietnamese. So he says we have to have Vietnamization. Vietnamization would be the, the U.S. will train Vietnamese, South Vietnamese troops and gradually turn more and more and more of the war over to them. You have seen this in your lifetime, ladies and gentlemen, in Iraq and attempts in Afghanistan to train, you know, in Iraq, they kept saying, we're training more and more troops, they're going to take more over, we're phasing out, and that's what has happened. In Afghanistan, that was the goal, too, was that you would have a phasing out after Afghan units were trained, and the U.S. would not be as, in it, as involved uh, there. But that's a little bit different situation with the Taliban versus the opposition forces they had in Iraq, so it hasn't worked out in quite the same way. But I digress a little. But it's, that's what the idea of Vietnamization is, is turning it over to the, the native fighters, basically training them and then leaving them in charge. Nixon, by 1971, is able to draw down the troops to about 156,000. So he's going to remove about 400,000 troops from combat, but the population feel so burned, they feel so misled, they don't understand the goals, they thought the U.S. is winning, they feel lied to, that this is just a chaotic disaster. And essentially, um, under Henry Kissinger's leadership, the Secretary of State, Nixon is trying to basically bomb the, the North, Korean, or North Vietnamese to the peace table. Um, he keeps bombing in North Vietnam, but at the same time saying, I'll stop it if you come to the peace table. So they end up getting a new peace agreement, ceasefire. The ceasefire gets broken. Fighting continues. The U.S. continues to draw down forces. And when the U.S. finally pulls out completely in 1975, South Vietnam, just their government collapses very quickly because they weren't behind the, the war effort. And unfortunately, even though there were a lot of really good intentions on the part of the United States of things like the strategic hamlets, it seemed like everything the United States did alienated the native population, a greater and greater amounts of it against them to where they were Viet Cong sympathizers or at least weren't supporting the U.S. So when the U.S. leaves, there really was no support to keep fighting. So that in a nutshell is kind of the big picture of what happens in the Vietnam War. Hopefully you listen to the podcast that discuss the origins of the Vietnam War. That's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.